Actual operating revenues exceeded actual operating expense, expenses by 403000 Availability fees actually collected during the year plus the 60-day accrual were 75% of budget. Debt service costs include 434000 of debt, debt issuance cost, which was from the $22 million bond issue that we did earlier in the, the fiscal year, and 411000 of capitalized interest, both of which are included in the borrowing of the wastewater treatment plant. The offsetting revenues are not included in a revenue line item under generally accepted accounting principles as the utility fund is an enterprise fund and I cannot record the revenue because I have to record the debt, not the revenue from the debt. Utility total revenues compared to total expenses reflect a loss of 990000 but included in this loss is the 851000 of the debt issuance cost and then capitalized interest, which were borrowed as part of the wastewater plan. The Dawn Wastewater Fund reflects build revenues over actual expenses. The loan payment, however, continues to be subsidized either by the utility fund or the general fund. Tourism Fund continues to reflect decrease in transient occupancy taxes. The expenditures were 94% of budget. Actual revenues over expenditures reflect a loss of 10000 which will be covered by the tourism fund balance. Capital projects funds have been amended to reflect ongoing projects, funding for the sheriff's vehicles and the sound system. Revenue for the sheriff's vehicles and sound systems are covered by a transfer from the general fund. 2011 ended on a good note for all but tourism and utilities. That's about the best I can say. Anybody have any questions? Oh, I'm, I'm sure we have a couple, but let's, let's just get to the bottom line here. Um, in your summary, you said it was $3.3 million. That's correct. In the leading up to it, you said it was in the general fund? 2.7. 2.7. The 2.7 is comparing your revenues to your budget. Right. The 3.3 which is where your fund balance comes from, is actual revenues, has nothing to do with budget. Your actual revenues over your actual expenditures. Actual revenues and expenditures. That's so, correct. And, and this is just as much for my understanding as for everybody else, but we may have saved or we may have gotten $2.7 million more in revenue. Quick math, we did 500, 600,000 less spending on the expenditure side somehow to come up to the 3.3 something in that nature kind of fuzzy math that's your fuzzy math yes general understanding okay so the actual 3.3 3.3 is the number that you need to keep in mind because for for audit purposes right. except for reporting your budget your report your budget is now history it's a it's a tool it's a guideline in a perfect world, we would collect every penny, and we would spend every penny, right. and there'd be nothing for fund balance. So fund balance is consisting of actual revenues over actual expenditures. Plus the actual expenditures. Now, does the 3.3 include the $900,000 loss in the utility fund? No, it does not. So the reality is it's really 2.4? No. Okay. They are two separate funds. The utility fund, based on the accrual, basis as it stands now does not need any subs any subsidized money from the general fund even though they show a loss they will show a loss on paper and their their fund deficit will be greater than what it currently is I'm not going to do that okay I'm not the only one who looks strange but all right we'll explain because that one a of bit the later. cash flow through the year right typically what the treasurer does on the utility fund, because the utility fund is always recorded as an on an accrual basis. It's right. based on billed revenues, not collected revenues. Right. Typically throughout the year, and it applies to all funds, under generally accepted accounting principles, we cannot show any fund with a negative cash balance because of the way the availability fees flowed and 
the revenues that we got from the bonds. The utility fund does not have a negative cash balance. It has a very small, very small cash balance, but it was enough so that no transfer of funds would have to be done to cover the negative cash balance. Okay. We are, we are obviously, for, for my understanding, going to have to talk about this a lot more, but just to just just last quick For sentence. 2011, it, it, it's okay. For 2012, I can't guarantee. Okay, but, but what, what I was going to say is, on paper, it looks like we lost $900,000. That's correct. But in reality, we had a very small surplus. They actually still had a very small loss, but they had enough cash that it covered them. To cover that? And again, because everybody in the world now wants to run their household like that, if you can lose $900,000 <laughs> and still be cash positive, that's really good. But we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, the reality is when I look in my pocket and say I've got X amount of money, I have $3.3 million. That's correct. Okay. All right, and we'll get to the accounting at another time. That was my question to make sure. And, and the one last thing is for the – for the rest of the board and staff that works on the budget, the heartburn that we go through during the budget because we always underestimate revenues, which is a very good business practice. That's correct. Because we underestimate our revenue, we don't come to this meeting at the end of the year and say, we have zero, there's, there is no cash balance or, or uh, cash flow. So that's a good thing. I'm not sure all of my heartburn from the budget session is eased, but if I got $3.3 million, I feel a lot better. Okay? So, questions, Mr. Underwood? None at this time, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Popowitz? No, sir. Mr. Seeley? No. Not right now. Do you want to you wanna go into the utility fund later? Because you yeah, had that same yeah. quizzical look I as, just, as did Mr. Underwood. I just, I, I can't like get it. my head around minus 900000 Is some of that covered by interest that was borrowed for the yes. money for... So we're actually using borrowed money to cover. The interest on the borrowed money is from what we have in the bank. Yes. Yeah. So There's it's really difference. borrowed money that's covered the debt. That's, that's correct. That's the conclusion I could come to. We need to follow up with a full-fledged right. meeting with, with Mrs. With Hatcher, and Mr. Schiebel, Schiebel yeah. a whiteboard, and a lot of uh, markers. Okay. Is that it? All right. So I think we need to do that again. But just... I mean, we all want to make sure we understand there's, there's a difference between actual cash basis and accrual. I never took economics, so we need to understand that a little more, and we'll have to set up a special session to do that. Mr. Akers. Ms. Hatcher, uh, <clears throat> under the general fund summary, under revenues, transfers, we had uh, amended the budget to show $108,000. Yes, sir. Well, tell, tell me what that was about. That is the transfer to cover the. There's several transfers, and it basically is a net, but the, the biggest portion of it was a transfer from the general fund to the capital projects fund to cover the sound system and the All right. four, four vehicles we purchased. The first four we but, bought. But it right. shows that year to date was $10,000. And we haven't finished all of our transfers yet. So you 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 three million. You're going to have three million. It's we just haven't finished all the interfund transfers. So that other ninety nine thousand dollars, basically, or ninety eight thousand dollars, has to come out of the three point three million dollars. Mm -hmm. All right. Under the dedicated personal property taxes that we transferred to the debt retirement. Yes, sir. How were the collections on personal property this year? Were they up? Yes, sir. Considerably. Yes, sir. This number that we budgeted, and the amended budget shows the same number, but our year-to-date, which was a transfer, I guess, to the debt retirement fund, is the same number. That's that correct. We budgeted. That's correct. I was under the impression that we had said that the increase that we that took place many years ago in the tax rate would automatically go toward debt retirement. Whatever that number was. It's $1.25. Right. Mm -hmm. But 
when I do I'm not the, sure how I understand that we have been able to to bring it in exactly what we had budgeted last year because we don't transfer it based on collections we just transfer it based on that we know based on the assessments that I get from Ms. Carter there's X dollars I know a dollar 25 of that is supposed to go and we budget that and then the Treasury just uses that number to we don't do it based on actual collections. And it's something that we might want to consider in future years of doing it based on actual collections rather than based just as a number. single number. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking in terms of when we put that increase in place, and it's probably been 20 years ago. Uh, it was in 1991 or 92 when we built the new uh, mm -hmm. middle school when it happened. Uh, we said to people that the increase, the dollar twenty-five cent increase in the tax rate, was going to go toward debt retirement for schools and other projects in the county. And I'm not sure we're being honest with them. Well, when I did the budget, I did it based on an idealistic world that you would collect every penny of what was on the assessed values, and that's never going to happen. Okay. And so, it, it, since we do that by journal entry and not by actual collections, we may we may want to talk about it in the next budget year uh, mm -hmm. process and well, just see where we. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think maybe between now and the, and the end of the year, probably we don't we meet once in October. Maybe we could have a meeting in October just to make sure we understand issues like that and the issues about how the $900,000 loss is not really a loss. But I think I understand, but if I don't, I'm not really comfortable. So I, I think the rest of the board would like to be comfortable with that same thing, too. So. As far as I, I see, um, Mrs. Hatcher, it looks like a good report. The good news is the county funds based on extra revenue, less spending, is $3.3 million for our unencumbered balance going forward. That's correct. Okay. Good job. All right. Thank you very much, then. It's always nice to be the bearer of good news. Yeah, for one, <laughs> for one, she said, uh, yeah, because I think if you just said it was $3.3 .3 million short, it would have been bad news for everybody concerned. All right, uh, appointments with Recreation Advisory, and Mr. Seeley, you said you're going to have that one at our next meeting? <coughs> Can't connect up. Okay. All right, we'll do that. Uh, consent agenda, we have warrants. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hatcher, let me take a step back. I know you, you can stay right there, but we had a... Uh, or I had an email, I, I hope the rest of the board did, that the school board got a grant in the amount of 300 and some thousand dollars. It's amount of 300, the school board got a grant in the amount of 300 and some thousand dollars for, um, I guess, a teacher performance plan. Hard to hire teacher schools. At, at specifically hard to hire teacher schools, but it was based on their performance raise. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. That 300000 will be list. It has to come to the board first, then we give it to the school board so they'll see an additional 300 and some thousand dollars in their budget. No? Okay. 99.9% of the school board's grants are reimbursement grants. So what they do is they have to spend it, ask for the reimbursement. We have worked with the schools. They are... Several years ago when I first came here, there was a, a, a lag in time of when they would get their reimbursements. Right. They are now, you know, every, every 30 days they are requesting the reimbursement, so there's no more than a 30-day lag okay. of getting it back. So in that sense, when, when we get to that, in that sense, the school board will spend, and, and it's, it's only for teachers who get, I guess, outstanding on their performance review, and the maximum is five thousand dollars, something of that nature. So they may not spend the whole three hundred thousand dollars. But the point is, they'll be using some of their funding that we gave them now to cover that three hundred thousand dollars or whatever part of it for at least thirty days. That's correct. So there's some like okay. Yes, can, sir. You, can, had a, you had a question? Yeah. There? Can we go back to this school budget, <laughs> if you will, as far as the 2010-2011 uh, state revenue? We had an amended budget of $20,915,000 for state funds. And year to date, we collected $19,886,000. So a little over a million dollar difference there. 
Now, will we be getting that or will we not be getting that? It is my understanding that what the school board does when they do their budget as well as their budget amendments is that if it covers more than a year's time, they request, they, for budget purposes, they do the whole amount at one time, even though it may take a year, 18 months, two years to actually go through it. But they've, they've spent some of this money already because they have spent 95% of that budget. And they've only collected 92% of that, bu of that budget. As I said, I have not backed out the prior year accruals nor put the new year accruals in for the school board because I haven't received them yet. And so it may be closer to where it's supposed to be based on that. When will you do that? Um, i got to do it before the 1st of October. The auditors are coming. Right. And also the federal government is, we budgeted one point, well, almost $1.2 million, and we only collected roughly $100,000 out of that. Depending on, for some of the, some of their state and federal, especially in their special funds, you actually have to look at the expenditures as well to see if there were expenditures spent. You have to, you almost have to compare theirs line item by line on the revenue to the expenditure. Can you get with your counterpart, school board, and, and find out where we are at and where the numbers line up as to what has been spent Federally, federal dollars as well as state dollars versus what we've collected. Yes, I can. I think it's important that we try to figure out uh, what we are paying for and what we're not getting getting reimbursed for. I can do that. Could you have it by the next meeting? I can try to. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Mrs. Hatcher, don't go anywhere because you're really popular today. No, you can, I mean, you can sit down, but we may just call on you again. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We had an at-large member for the, um, the Rec Recreation Committee. And Mr. Underwood, I think you were going to check because Mr. Tillman was in your district originally or? Ms. Quincy Marsh. Qu Quincy Marsh, right. Did you find somebody? All right. Now, who's your regular foreman down there? Right. And Lorenzo, so, Lorenzo is the current at large. He is a, he, a Lorenzo he's Tillman one. is a, a at large member to, present. And you're talking about Quincy Mars. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Parton, you want to clear that Well, we, we have one <coughs> at large vacancy because right. Mr. Collins is no longer a resident of the county, so uh, we do have that. And maybe there have been some confusion on the other one, but I do know we have that one vacancy as an at-large member. And Mr. Collins is from Port Royal, and you were looking for one, and Mr. Akers was going to follow up with one, and we, you don't have one. So why don't... Right, right. So, all right. We meet again, Mr. Seeley, you don't have one either. <coughs> so you're appointing the Bowling Green one. Um, would Mr. Underwood and Mr. Akers work together and, and see sure. if you can find somebody? We'll, we'll make those appointments sure. at our 27th meeting. Okay, so we can then move ahead and you know, make sure, because I'm sure Mr. Howard would like to uh, get started with that if he hasn't gotten started already. We want to make sure we're all represented. Okay. <coughs> Um, now we're going to move on to agenda item number three, which is the consent agenda. Uh, approval of warrants. This is um, item B is the school board grant we were just talking about. Uh, C is adoption of the 50th anniversary of the Garden Club. Uh, adoption of resolution declaring local emergencies for the earthquake, Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee. Frogs and locusts are next. Agenda item E, resolution for Caroline's promise. F, resolution and appreciation for Alma Powell. G is lifting of water restrictions. Anything board members like to have pulled off? Mr. Chairman, make a motion. We approve the consent agenda as presented. Outline is amended. Second. Mr. Popowitz makes a second. Motion made by Mr. Akers, seconded by Mr. Popowitz. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries <laughs> unanimously. Mr. Fincham, do you have agenda item 12? That's the uh, open space easement for Meadowview. Is that yours? It is. Can we do that one now? I thought that would be fairly simple. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, you have a memo in my packet um, covering a request from uh, Dr. Sheridan, who is requesting that the Caroline County Board of Supervisors hold uh, an open space easement on uh, a 14-acre parcel that they wish to purchase together with an existing three-acre parcel that they already own. So it would be a total of about 17 acres of land. I think the board's well aware that Meadowview has been uh, in existence at their uh, location on Fredericksburg Turnpike for over 15 years now. Uh, and they have uh, done an extensive amount of uh, environmental research and uh, protection um, concerning several endangered species in the area. Because of the size of the acreage, they do not qualify uh, that some of the uh, state agencies or other conservation organizations, such as Department of Forestry, Virginia Outdoors Foundation, etc., will not hold uh, the open space easement. Uh, in their application to secure funding, uh, Dr. Sheridan asked whether Caroline County Board of Supervisors would be willing to hold uh, an easement in lieu of one of the uh, other agencies because of the, the acreage uh, limitation, and prepared an application for funding um, subject to the approval of the board uh, to hold that easement. Given its location, its nature, the fact that the, the property in question really is not appropriate for development, you know, staff has worked with Dr. Sheridan on this request um, and would support um, Dr. Sheridan's request uh, for an open space easement on this property. And with that, I'll answer any questions that the board may have. Obviously, the question the board's probably going to have is what liability would the board have by holding this easement? Basically, the easement is to restrict it, you know, from, from development or inappropriate use. The underlying ownership still rests with the owner. Uh, and the open space easement, the final document would have to be in a form, one, approved by the board of supervisors, and two, approved by the county attorney to make sure that, that we're, we're protected in all aspects. I saw the county attorney show up, so okay. We will discuss that, I guess, later as the second step. The first step is to see if the board would like to move forward. Yes, sir. Then the, the second step would be to draft the appropriate uh, documents to make sure we're okay, right? Yes, sir. And there, there are guidelines on, on uh, you know, holding these easements that are set forth by the Commonwealth of Virginia. So right. there, there's significant documentation out there. Okay. And I think that's Dr. Sheridan in the back there. Okay, yes. All righty. Um, any questions of Mr. Fincham at this time? Yeah, I, I did have one. Um, you said the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, I guess they allow us to do this because it's... Yes, through, through the uh, Code of Virginia, okay. uh, local governments or, or governments are author a recognized and authorized body to hold such easements. Okay, that, that's all I have. Any other questions? Motion? To, uh, I guess the action item for us would be to allow staff to move forward with developing the, or, yeah, developing the easement and the appropriate documentation to go along with that. So is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Popwood, second by Mr. Underwood. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Fincham, while you're there, can I do the first reading of the proposed zoning ordinance, text amendment? Um, I think we've got it. It's the first reading. You got it scheduled for public hearing already? Or can schedule it for public hearing? This is the Highway Corridor Overlay District Text Amendment. Yes, sir. In a nutshell, this was presented to the board uh, at your last meeting where we requested uh, that 
we be allowed to do the first reading of the HCOD regulations tonight with the idea of going to public hearing at your September 27th meeting. I think there's an overview of the HCOD regulations in your packet. In a nutshell, what we have found is that in developing the design and architectural standards in the HCOD regulations, there are certain areas where the most comprehensive plans, Lady Smith, Bowling Green, even Carmel Church, have uh, an element of traditional neighborhood development or, or, or urban design, village design in those plans as developed by the planning committees. When applied in the highway corridor overlay context, sometimes those standards uh, are not appropriate, particularly around the interstate interchanges. What this amendment seeks to do is to clean up those discrepancies to ensure that those design standards are applied in the corridors where they are appropriate, but right around the interstate interchanges where, uh, where those standards may not be appropriate to actually encourage or assist with our commercial and economic development uh, efforts by cleaning up those standards that are inconsistent. And that's the proposed changes in a nutshell. Fairly simple. Um, just, just for me to make sure, in our packet, um, item H is the Route six, 639, Landor Drive to the intersection of 633. And I just want to remember, 633 is Bull Church Road, right? Yes, sir. Okay. That entire corridor right. is... And that's all commercial. There's well, there's some residential when you get out west of, of Route 1, going okay. back towards Lake Landor. That, that segment of Route 639 is designated within the highway corridor overlay. Right. The section from Route 1 to Route 633, or Bull Church Road, is, is the proposed commercial corridor designation where your commercial development would be more consistent with, inter with the interstate interchange standards versus your main street Right. town center type of development. I same, just to, yeah. and same thing for Route 207. Right. And I just want to make sure 633 was Bull Church Road because that's a very appropriate break. It's, it's right where the lumber place is and across the street from Virginia Bazaar just yes, about. So that is a very interstate kind of friendly place. Yes, okay. Sir. Uh, I'm fine. Any questions? Any problems with moving this forward to public hearing? I just had a question. C in, in section 15.2. Yes, sir. Read that boundary. Well, take that out. I, I just, it, it doesn't exist. Well, yes, sir. It's already in there, and we had actually intended to take that out. Okay. But thank you for pointing that out to us. He was the one that said 301 north of the corporate limits of the town of Bowling Green to the boundary of Fort AP Hill Military Reservation. Yes, that's when we actually had that segment of 301 in the county. When that belonged to the county. That's yes. really, yeah, that's really what it was. So right. now the, the town runs almost to that line. It, so It in fact does. Just so okay. we don't. That's good. That's fine. That's fine. Thank uh, you. Ms. Mr. Popovich, you had a question? No. Oh, your light was on. Okay, Ms. Akers? I have a question. I'm just going to say that... Uh, like the idea that we have now tried to uh, have a separation between a highway corridor or overlay district uh, that has residential as well as other types of businesses and a commercial overlay uh, highway overlay district which is going to be around the, right. the interstate sections and will allow some development uh, along those inter interstate corners if you will uh, without causing a great deal of cost to That's the, good point. Uh, people. So I like this I like this concept and of course, that one house that's um, just past Route 1 or just past 95 on the left-hand side, I think that's your district, there's one house, maybe two, as you're going up 639. Those are all grandfathered. They don't have to do anything else special. They're not really going to develop any house. So it doesn't make a difference, right? 
That's correct. Okay. If, they, if there was a change in use, and even under the change in use, 